Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss the role of injections in the management of cervical spondylosis. This is an excerpt from a broader course on the non-surgical management of cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. A second very important non-surgical treatment modality that we use for cervical spondylosis is cervical injections. I'd like to take a few minutes to explain what cervical injections are and what they're trying to achieve. So cervical injections come in a few different types. And again, as a neurosurgeon in the United States, I don't generally do injections. Uh, nevertheless, I can explain kind of how we use injections both therapeutically and diagnostically. They come in a few different types, as I mentioned. The common ones are things like epidural injections, selective nerve root injections, facet injections, and trigger point injections. And these are all different, and what makes them different is how it is done and what the target is. Usually injections are done by specially trained physicians. Now, particularly the first three, epidural, selective nerve root, and facet injections, generally done by specialists in interventional pain. That can be people like physiatrists who are spine medicine specialists. It can be done by anesthesia and pain management, interventional pain management uh, specifically, types of physicians. And then there are some interventional neurologists that will do this as well. Now, in other countries, certainly some surgeons will do their own injections, but who performs it is really less relevant, except to know that when you're getting injections, you wanna make sure that the person that is doing it has experience and training specifically in that. Now, as these different injections are done, they will target different areas. So the first one we'll talk about is gonna be epidural injections. So an epidural injection, as the name implies, is an injection where the fluid goes in the space around the dura. So if you look at this image, this is kind of looking at it from the back, like a three-quarter view where you can see the cervical spine. The back of it is over here. Here's the nerve, the spinal nerve here, and here's the spinal cord, and then the disc in the front. So we're kind of looking at the back of the cervical spine here. An epidural injection in the cervical spine usually goes in between the lamina. So people will say interlaminar epidural injection. This is the lamina here, this is another lamina. So I show here a needle that would come in and go into the space between these two lamina. Now if you look at a slice like this, that looks a bit like here, they'd be bringing in a needle that comes in from the back and goes into this space around the dura. So the dura is like the wrapping of the spinal cord the nerves are all in, uh, uh, encapsulated in that as well. There's a root sleeve that you can kind of see over here as the nerve is kind of surrounded a bit like the sleeve of my jacket. When they do an injection, they're trying to get into the space right around the dura. Often when they go in at say C71, they put enough liquid in to see it actually float up and canvas an area. So it's not necessarily the case that an injection at C71 is only addressing problems at that level. They can get either with a catheter or with fluid to get all the way up in the epidural space. So it's not super specific necessarily. It can cover nerves on both sides, but very effective at delivering anti-inflammatory steroid right into the area of this inflammation. So that is the first and most common type of cervical injection that is done by a specialist is an epidural injection. The second type of injection that we're gonna talk about is much less commonly employed in the cervical spine. It is something called a selective nerve root injection. That is an injection that is commonly done from the front. Here you can see a picture of the spine from the front. This is the front, this is the disc over here, the front of one of the vertebral bodies. You can see the spinal cord in that dura along with the nerve as it leaves here with the sleeve around it. And this injection is typically done here, you can see as this, if this is like mimicking a needle, that it would come in in this trajectory and they would deliver steroid right to this area. So why might you do that? There is value in targeting that nerve specifically. When you put contrast and an anti-inflammatory there, it would be a low volume injection just to kind of target that nerve specifically. And again, if you're trying to get a nerve on the right and the left, that's usually two different sticks, one on the right and one on the left. An epidural injection, by contrast, is usually in the middle, and you can kind of canvas the area and get nerves on both sides. So which injection makes sense depends a lot on the clinical scenario, but that is on a high level what a selective nerve root injection is. The last injection to talk about is something called a facet injection. 
So this is a picture looking at your spine from the side. It's a three-dimensional view, so you can see some of the joints and some of the arthritis. This is the back of the spine here and the front of the spine over here. This is another picture looking at a slice of your an axial view of it, and you can see the front of the spine over here, spinal cord over there. Here's a nerve on one side, a nerve on the other, and this is the back or the lamina, the spinous process over here. Here you can see there's all this arthritis involving the joint in the back here. There's even a bit of arthritis, what we call uncovertebral hypertrophy, which all is causing pressure on the nerve right there. So the epidural injection we mentioned, or the selective nerve root injection, those are targeting the neurological structures, the nerve itself on one or both sides. The facet injection is targeting the bony stuff, the joint itself, or the facet joint. So if you look at a needle that would come in from the back, it would target this area specifically. And most of the time, what they're really trying to target is a little branch called a medial nerve, which is a little branch of the parent nerve. So for example, if you look here, you can see a little nerve coming off the side. It's like a twig that comes off the side that innervates or provides nerve endings to that joint. So when they do a medial branch block, what they're trying to do is block that nerve to see if that will help cool off the symptoms that are coming from the arthritis in the neck. Now, often when they do a medial branch block or facet injection, it is a diagnostic tool in advance of something called a rhizotomy or a radiofrequency ablation, which isn't strictly an injection, it's going in and burning that nerve. Now, patients get alarmed. The reason I wanna talk about this specifically is when they say you're gonna burn my nerve, it sounds like they're gonna burn something very important. Now, that little twig is not trivial, but at the same time, it's not the main nerve here, like the C5 or the C6 nerve. It's that little twig that comes off of it. So if you think of a tree, it's not the main branch, it's certainly not the tree trunk, it's a little twig on the end that goes right to the joint that they're really burning, and that is called a rise rhizotomy or radiofrequency ablation. So facet injections and the radiofrequency ablations target this particular area and are much more effective at neck pain. So cervical injections can really be thought of in those main categories. Sometimes you'll go to your primary care doctor or even a pain management person, and if they just do an injection where they say, how does that feel, and, and put a needle in where you're having muscular pain, that is a different type of injection. It's called a trigger point injection. Those are very common very nonspecific, certainly can help people, but not one of the things I really wanted to, to talk about in great detail with this specific section. Now, if you look at cervical injections, there's a few things to know about them. When they're injecting, they're injecting a liquid. The liquid can have different components, and often the person doing the injection is the one kind of composing that and saying, oh, I want this type of steroid and this type of anesthetic. But you can think of the ingredients in that liquid really being one of three categories, and there can be a mix of these. One of them is a steroid, very commonly. That's why we call them an epidural steroid injection. The steroid it is what gives people the anti-inflammatory effect. It doesn't take effect right away. It sometimes takes a few days to cool the nerve itself off, but the steroid is probably the most important ingredient. Sometimes they will have a local anesthetic agent also, which helps numb the nerve right away. That is useful sometimes for diagnostic injections. So if I call a pain management person and say, hey, I'd really like to target, say, the C6 nerve, they can sometimes put a local anesthetic which won't last as long, but can be quite diagnostic. So that is an ingredient that may or may not be in the injectate that they use. And then most of the time, this is done with fluoroscopy that we'll talk about in a second. So in order to see the liquid on x-ray, you need to have a contrast agent in it, something that looks dark on x-ray. So those are typically the three ingredients that people will use. And they all come in different types. There are different steroids you can use, different types of anesthetic, and usually one of a couple types of contrast agent you can use. But that is what they are actually injecting into your cervical spine. As I mentioned, most of the time it is done with fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is an x-ray machine that allows them to do live x-ray. So as they put the needle in, they can see where the needle is going, they can verify they're in the right spot, they can inject the liquid and see where the liquid has gone. And that is valuable to make sure that they're in the right spot and that the injection that they're giving you is, giving, is, is meant to give you relief. Sometimes they will do it with sedation. This can be alarming. Some people can be very anxious about it, and so they can give you light sedation when it is done. Of course, the constraint there is that if you get sedation, somebody needs to drive you there and drive you back. You can't typically drive yourself home after getting sedation, but that's something to discuss in advance when you see the interventionalist to kind of talk about whether or not you'll be getting sedation so you can make appropriate plans around it. 
And then it could be done in a procedure room. You may go to an office and they say, hey, we've got a procedure room, we can do it over here, we have x-rays set up over there, or it may be done in the operating room. But just so you know what to expect, that's something to ask the interventionalist, like where they typically do their injections. And it doesn't really matter which one of those. There's not one that's necessarily better than the other, but just so you know, kind of thinking about the setting is, is valuable as well. So after getting the injections, I find it very valuable to look at those records. I want to know what was targeted. Was it the joint? Was it epidural? Was it selective or not? It doesn't really matter how selective it is. It's not critical. It can be nice if they're selective, but it's not essential. But before just saying, oh, injections didn't work, you want to get a sense of what type of injection. It might be that a facet injection didn't work, but that the epidurals would, or vice versa. So knowing what was done, I think, is important. And especially if you're a patient, being an engaged patient that understands, like, okay, what was done and how did I respond to it is valuable in the decision-making of your condition. You want to also pay attention to the extent of relief. Was it a lot of relief? Was it complete relief? Was it very little or was it none? Those are all different answers from our perspective. How long did the relief last? It is not uncommon for me to see a patient who gets tremendous relief from an injection, but it only lasts like five days. And they'll come in like two months after that and be like, that was a waste of time, it didn't help me at all. That's a very different answer. Getting a lot of relief for five days means that the problem is so severe that injections weren't really gonna help. Maybe surgery could be very effective. Whereas somebody who gets an injection and gets no relief at all can be an indication that we're barking up the wrong tree, that the symptoms are coming from elsewhere. So in that sense, knowing where the injection was done and what kind of relief, the extent of relief you got, and how long that relief lasted is very important diagnostically. If it lasts a long time, of course, these injections can be therapeutic. And quite commonly, people can get sustained relief between time, physical therapy, and injections and not end up needing surgery. So in general, cervical injections are a very important adjuvant non-surgical treatment modality that we use when we're evaluating and managing people with cervical spondylosis. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.